Listening to 100 Words or Less with Ray Harkins. Greetings, one. Greetings, all. Thank you for consuming this podcast. And I know it may seem trite, just like thanking you week after week for listening to this podcast, but genuinely do appreciate it. There's so many things that you could be doing besides listening to this podcast, and I do appreciate it. I have a great guest this week. His name is Jacob Duarte. He sings and plays guitar for the band Narrowhead, which I admit, I was slow to take them in. I enjoyed their their earlier output and was like, oh, it's cool, it's cool. Didn't really like flip my switch full on, but this newest record that is coming out on Run For Cover is extremely, extremely good. It's called Moment of Clarity, and um, yeah, you can stream some of the singles. I think it comes out on the 23rd of this month, which is January of 2023. Well, that's the first time I've said 2023 out loud. That's weird. Anyways, but Jacob, uh, great conversation. He is a true Texas head in regards to um, just having a lot of experience, obviously, playing in bands within the scene, and then, um, yeah, was able to dig in deep with him on that. But let's talk about some business pleasantries, and if you are so inclined, I would love to get a star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, and a rating, I was about to say star, I think it's a five-star rating on Spotify. Um, Obviously, you know, I'm not going to encourage you to, or I'm not going to force your hand in regards to a five-star review, but do with that what you will. It just helps the algorithm. It helps people find the show that need to find the show. And also just tell your friends. That's the best way to, you know, hand to mouth where you're talking about like, hey, friend, you like this person. You should probably listen to this interview. Also, thank you to many of you who listen to the companion podcast to this show called More On That uh, exclusively on Spotify. You can dip into the show notes for this particular podcast and you'll be able to find a quick link to it. Uh, I was able to dive deeper into the best of 2022 list where I uh, just highlighted some more music that did not make it to my list. But, um, you know, you get the point. You're able to listen to more music. A lot of people gave me some positive feedback in regards to, hey, this felt like a radio show. And I'm like, that's exactly what I am going after. So working on some other ideas there that don't exactly fit the mold of this, uh, you know, question and answer sort of interview conversations of this podcast. But anyways, and then you can also... If you want to listen to this podcast on YouTube, I'm uploading a lot of the previous episodes on there, but then also just these new ones as they come out. So please dip into the show notes. You'll be able to, again, find a link, subscribe. It just helps. Anyways, that is what I got for that. Let's talk to Jacob and, uh, yeah, how awesome Narrowhead is and obviously how great Texas is as a hardcore slash punk scene. Let's go. obviously have a long history within Texas hardcore and, uh, you know, punk and being active in an incredible amount of bands. The thing that always has, uh, I guess, perplexed me about uh, Texas hardcore and punk in general is Mm -hmm. that there's this idea that people are aware that it exists, obviously, from the many bands that have come out of your scene. But it, it definitely just gets short shrift where it's like, you know, people pay attention to the coasts and there's obviously that sort of Midwest yeah. Southern reputation. Do you, I presume that you have noticed it? Do you have a chip on your shoulder against it? Or is it just like, nah, man, we're just doing our stuff down here. You know, maybe at some point, you know, I'd, I'd have a chip on my shoulder about it and just be like, yo, like, it's just funny that no one pays attention to us because we're just all the way down here. But like, not really, dude, like, it's kind of cool. Like we have our own thing going on. Like, whatever chip on my shoulder I had is gone. And I, and, and I kind of like, uh, it's like, I uh, appreciate it like a little bit more. Cause like it's a little, it's kind of uh, 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 underground, you know, like it's always like with all music, even with our rap and stuff, you know, like 
Texas has always been pretty underground and the real heads know, you know, it's like, that's how I feel about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you, it's like, if you know, you know. Yeah. And like, that makes it cooler. Cause like, if you don't know about it, maybe you're missing out and maybe you're not cool. Cause you didn't, cause you don't know the underground stuff or, or you know what I'm saying? Like not, not like, like directly, but you know. Yeah. You're not, there's not this uh, gatekeeper aspect, but there's the idea that you just have to dig enough below the surface in order for you to actually engage with it. Totally. Yeah. That's uh, and I think, I mean, I think California, just cause that's where I'm from, definitely has a closer point of view where, because, you know, so many of the bands, whether it's, you know, Iron Age, Power Trip, et cetera, et cetera, always came out for either Sound Inferior, obviously just playing shows and stuff like that. Yeah. It, it did, did you feel, uh, I guess, like once you started to get out there and play shows outside of your state, did you feel a connection to California or am I just looking too um, deeply into it? I think the California, Texas thing was more like not really my generation. Cause like, you know, like, I, like I know people out there and I'm friends with them, but like, I, I, like, like Scourge has never done any California stuff and like, sure. But we're not like obviously like I love Cali and stuff. It's awesome and and there's some good bands out there. But like the connection like with my group and my g- g- generation, we don't really like have a Cali like c- 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 connect like Iron Age did and stuff. You know, right? Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. And kind of putting the spotlight on you as a person, uh, I know that you were born and raised in Dallas. What was your uh, family structure? Born and raised in Houston. Right? Oh, I <laughs> thank you for correcting me. Thanks, thank internet. Uh, so you're you're born. Know, thing comes like I, like I don't know when you search us up. Sometimes it's still there, but uh, it's funny too because like the most of- offensive thing you could say to a Houstonian is that they're from Dallas. <laughs> right. Yeah, you're like <laughs> it's like. You're making if you're making a mistake, you're making the worst mistake by yeah, saying I'm from Dallas. I was born and raised in Houston, and um, yeah, what was your uh, like? Where were you asking about that though? Yeah, I was just uh, curious about your. I mean, I have been to Houston a few times, and it's an interesting city in regards to there's clearly a downtown area and a, it feels like a large enough city, but you know, yeah. you drive yeah. five minutes outside and then it's just, you know, sprawling suburbs. Uh, what was your experience growing up in Houston? Um, like, so I grew up kind of in like the inner city, like maybe 10, 10, 10 minutes from downtown that you could see the skyline from my house and stuff. Um, so I was always like, like in the city and like a, yeah. And when I started going to shows, a bunch of my friends were out in the suburbs and for, and, and there was this just one venue out there. And that's just where like a lot of shows would end up because in the suburban like shopping center and it, and it was like a venue. And, Got uh, it. Dude. Yeah. So like, like uh, uh, I would always drive out to the suburbs. My, like my dad like stayed out there too. So like, I, like I've kind of been all, all over like Houston since I've been a kid. So um, it's cool. Like I like it. It's my favorite city in Texas, you know, like it's, uh, it's really big. There is a lot of music here, but like a lot of the, a lot of the music scenes are just like separated. Like it's so big that like, it's easy to not know what's going on too. You know, like, yeah, I don't know. There's just like, there's a lot going on. It's not a very musical city though. You know, like they care more about, oil and things like that it's like a very like oil related city and stuff but yeah I mean, it's cool like it's my home uh that's where i feel most co- comfortable sure mm. and what was your uh family structure like growing up like uh, you know mom and dad in the house brother and sister what yeah, was so, it? um my mom and dad were never married and they they like tried it out when i was like a kid but uh, like they were separated when i was like three or four and like that's always been the uh, the, the, the like the like, like the like did like the normal like like uh like 
Yeah, it never seemed like a big deal that my mom and dad were separated because I have a stepmom and a stepdad and they're both sick. So I, I grew up with these two like separate mom and dads kind of, you know, um, and my dad's side, I had two sisters and, and I'm the oldest and my mom's side, I'm like, I'm the only child. So I kind of went back and forth a lot, but I mainly stayed with my mom. So I was kind of like an only child on the like on the weekdays you know and then I, and then i'd go to my dad's like like when i was in school so, sure um but yeah like they they were like always separated as long as i've as long as i've been around you know yeah well it's interesting for you to have the experience of like you said bouncing back and forth between being an only child and then also having like you're very lucky in the experience of having step parents that both were supportive and cool. Cause you know, sometimes you can really get the short end of the stick with that. Yeah. yeah I'm blessed with that. They're, they're yeah. Cool. And what kind of kid did you find yourself, uh, you know, being interested in? Was it, uh, you know, were you skating sports? Like, did you care about school comics? Like what was the thing as you were, you know, like preteen yeah. years as you started to kind of experiment with stuff? Yeah. So like, since I was a little kid, I've always been stoked on music and skateboarding. You know, my, like my dad played in a band, my dad skated, my stepdad skated and surfed, you know, he's like an old school, like skater dude. So that's always kind of been around me. And that's just been what I've been interested in. Um, kind of since the beginning, like, like I've always loved music and skateboarding, but when I was a kid, like I would play sports and shit like that, but I'm not really a sports guy. Like I was like good in school, like if I tried, but I just never could hold my attention. So yeah, dude, it's always just kind of been like music, like since I was a kid. Sure. That was the thing that really latched on and gravitated towards. Yeah. Yeah. Like like I've always like, since I could remember, like had a dream of just playing music and concerts and being a rock star, I guess, you know, (laughs) Sure. kids that think about that stuff. It's just like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you care about school? Like, did you find any subjects interesting? How were the grades? Like, did you just kind of exist in there? Kind of dude. I didn't really care about school. I was just trying to get through it, you know, like, especially like in the school districts in Texas, like, to be honest, like, I don't think they're teaching anyone anything. Like I can like remember basic tools from school, but like to have an impact from high school like nah like i don't yeah i don't learn shit like that you know what i mean like, <laughs> right yeah like, like you just go into school you pass your class like like i wasn't in any advanced classes or anything and i was just like another number i like, got that school mm-hmm. but like like yeah like i had like most of my friends were people i met at shows and they didn't go to my school so i would just i would just like get through the week and then the, the weekend would come and I'd go see my friends or like go to a show or something. Yeah. Would you uh, define yourself as a, uh, you know, troublemaker where you getting into general mischief as a kid or were you, you know, kind of living by the, the rules, so to speak? Yeah. I mean, I was actually like, I was talking about this with someone the other day. I didn't really get into trouble. Like I never really got in trouble with the law. The only times I'd get in trouble at school was like talking or like, you know, like just stupid shit skipping. But I wasn't like, like, I don't even think I started smoking weed until I was like a- a- after school. Like I, I wasn't scared of it, but I just like didn't have an interest in like drinking and doing stuff like that. I wasn't straight edge or anything, but mm-hmm. was, uh, I was a pretty well behaved kid for the most part. I mean, you'd get in trouble every now and then, but I was never like in jail or talking to cops and shit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and I'm sure you experienced this with some of your friends that, you know, maybe were getting more in trouble. Like it would just prevent you from doing the things that you actually wanted to do, like, you know, go to a show or whatever, where it's like, man, why are you getting in so much trouble? (laughs) Yeah. Like, I think I was blessed to be interested in something that kept me out of that shit, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, and I know that you've mentioned it in other interviews uh, where, you know, your dad and uncle were pivotal in getting you into, you know, bands and music and the whole kind of DIY scene. But the thing that really stuck out to me was the fact that 
they were also showing you like much deeper cuts beyond just, you know, whatever your classic rock stuff like that. But, you know, showing you like Sunday day real estate in Texas is the reason. Yeah. When did you realize that that wasn't very uh, common <laughs> to like get that from your parents and uncle and stuff? Pretty early on because, dude, because I can remember like, even, like, I think it was my dad who showed me like under oath. So my dad like cuts <laughs> up and shit too. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I already knew that that was kind of like, not the norm. But when I found out that they were showing me deep cuts, I was about 15 and I was like, yo, like, like it, it's like my friends are starting to talk about sunny day and jawbreaker, but I've been knowing that, you know what I mean? So I always knew it wasn't like, like, like most parents don't have tastes like that or, or whatever, but it wasn't until I was like 15 and 16 when I was like, Oh, like uh, I'm interested in the exact same things that they were when they were my age, you know? Right. That's, that, that's cool too, that they were not only showing you stuff that, you know, you clearly weren't of age to really either see those bands, but they also kept up. I mean, like yeah. getting introduced to under oath, like that's also a, a weird yeah. Yeah, look from a parent. And we went to, uh, uh, my dad took, t- took me to, 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 to warp tour. And they were the first band that I saw there that day. And it was sick. That's amazing. That's a good memory. <laughs> sure, sure. And then especially too, where you could talk to your friends about the things that you, like you said, you'd been listening to, you know, Texas, the reason for years. And you'd be like, oh, you guys are just getting into that record. <laughs> it's yeah, pretty yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. Well, like what happened too was uh, around that time, like my friends would bring up bands that like, I remember he, 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 hearing and checking out, but I didn't dive into it until I realized that oh, like my, like my dad and and and, 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 and like, like that 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 like my dad was showing me and stuff that was actually sick. That's amazing, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and when, it, like you said, music had always been a big part of your life. When did you start kind of recognizing the fact that you wanted to, you know, play in a band and wanted to create music? I know you said that you had those rock star dreams, you know, early at an early age, but when did you, when did that become more real? Like, Oh, I can actually do this. I mean, I started playing a sh- my, like my first show was like 14. Okay. So that was when the, like, like I, I knew I could play shows, but I, I would always like imagine like, you know, like, yeah, I feel like it didn't really like come clear to me until I was like 19 or 20 when like, I, I think I booked my first tour and it was like a pretty crazy re re out, like started in San Antonio and the second day was in Miami, like something crazy like that. (laughs) And like, uh, right. And after that, like I made some friends and then I booked another tour and it was easier to book. And that was around the time when I was really like, just like down to like, just to play in bands and stuff. Like I always had like a little job and stuff, but yeah, like it really started to make sense to me that like, like if I tried that, um, that, that, that I could make you like maybe make something happen. I was like 19 or 20, like 2012 or something. Or sure. Sure. And did you have any other, uh, I guess, you know, life path or ambition from a career perspective? Like, you know, what did your parents do? Like, was there an idea that you were going to follow uh, their footsteps? Like, like in high school, I was pretty naive and I just assumed like, oh, I'll graduate, go to college. Didn't really have a, a goal past that. Like, I didn't know what I would go to college for. All I knew was, okay, the next step after high school is, I guess, go to college. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um and that didn't really happen. I, uh, after I graduated, I just got a job and just was trying to just like make them like, like, I like, like just like have my own money, things like that. And just like play shows because I was like, I wasn't sure what my real goal was, but I knew that I wanted to play music. So I was like, okay, I, I was kind of just like getting by with like playing shows and just having a job. You know, I wasn't really getting anywhere like with music, but like we were still doing stuff. And and I guess I was getting somewhere, but it was just moving slow. But yeah. Right. Well, and I think that once you start to 
like you said, have the experience of booking tours and, you know, playing shows, you build your life around that where it's like, I don't necessarily care what my job is as long as I can leave for a couple of weeks at a time and come back and maybe have a job. Yeah, like I've quit so many jobs. I've been fired. Like I've had so many jobs. Right. <laughs> what, what would it's you easy to get a job? I sure. Mean, not, not a good one, but it's easy to get one. You know what I mean? <laughs> Sure, sure. What was the, uh, just because it, it, I find these stories uh, interesting or funny, what was the uh, most dramatic you leaving a job just being like, all right, well, I'm going on tour, whether you guys like it or not? Yeah, I um, I had a job at this like machine shop. I was like 18 and uh, I was making like $10 an hour. I had to be there at 7 a.m. It was like the shittiest fucking job I ever had. Right. And uh, I think I just didn't go back or something. Like I had for a couple months and I was just like, yo, honestly, fuck this. I'm about to like, or maybe I I asked off to go play in Austin and I couldn't get it. And I was just like, I don't care that much. So I'm just, I'm just going to dip. Right. <laughs> like I'm not going to use you guys as a reference. We're okay. Yeah, no way. Oh boy. Rockabilia.com is back for another year of partnerships. At least I'm crossing my fingers that they won't all of a sudden wake up and be like, no, this advertising isn't working. But we are not there. <laughs> and rockabilly.com is the place where you can buy all of your officially licensed merch. I don't care if you're into The Grateful Dead, Bring Me the Horizon, Slipknot. You will be able to find it all there. And I use the words officially licensed because the bands get paid on this stuff. And that is great as opposed to buying horrific bootlegs on Amazon or eBay. You, It's happened. I mean, come on, you've bought something off eBay being like, oh, that looks like a cool shirt. And then you wash it once and it's terrible. The design fades, the band doesn't get paid. It's a lose-lose scenario. Use this promo code. 100 words or less gets you 10% off your order. Go to Rockabilia, shop to your heart's content. Use the promo code 100 words or less, 10% off your order. Love it. And I, I'm just essentially giving you a free shirt. That's what I'm doing. So rockabilia.com, have fun. I also love that... Um, because there, I mean, especially once you start to, you know, tour and punk and hardcore bands and start to realize, like you said, the idea of, you know, having a job that you can either maybe return to or just quit. Um, the, the like when you do find a person and a job that understands the concept of touring and then like you'll come back and you'll have a job, you're just like, oh my gosh, can I work for you forever? Yeah, yeah. And, and the places that did do that for me, like it didn't last long, but like, right. <laughs> Because because they would realize how long you would be gone, and they're like, "Yeah, is and Jacob probably, ever coming back?" Yeah. And they probably thought I was going on tour, and it was just like, uh, "Oh, that's cool. He's like doing his dream." But you like, but, but that, but they probably thought that that would be the only one or something, right? Right. That's yeah. like this is going to continue on, and it's like, yeah. oh no, I'm yeah, stop. right. <laughs> um, when you, uh, I, I'm gonna guess, like, was guitar your first instrument, or were there the other things you messed around with initially? Um, my dad played drums, so I think the first thing I ever like touched was a drum set. And I, like, I, like, I obviously wasn't good, but I knew, like, how how to play drums. Like, I knew, like, you had to, like, I got to stay on beat and things like that. But uh, um, since my parents were separated, my mom lived in a small house. She was not gonna buy me a drum set. So the next thing was just to 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 like have a stringed instrument. I dabbled with some bass, but mainly g- guitar was the main thing that I <laughs> excelled at the fastest. Sure. And what would you say were some of the uh, I guess foundational bands that as you started to, you know, scratch deeper underneath the surface of you know what your dad and uncle kind of introduced you to what bands did you feel like were kind of your own as you started to get into stuff um i mean like i like i feel like my favorite bands have always switched around as i've gotten older you know of course but i remember when i was in middle school i bought that every time i die uh, that 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 shit happens in movies that they. Oh make. yeah, the DVD, absolutely. And that just like turned me on to be like, yo, is, is touring fun like that? Like that's what made <laughs> me like really like 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 like, 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 like going to do the band life thing. And I also thought it every time I die I was sick too. Like at that point, but you know, like when I was a kid, I I liked Blink One Eighty Two a lot, and they were like my first favorite band that that I could remember like. I kind of seeking out by myself, but, I, but I was also like six, you know? Um, right. 
But that's a good question, though. I don't really know. Like it, it kind of depends on the time period you're asking about. It's like switches around a lot. Right? Oh yeah, no, I and I think usually it starts off. I mean, when I ask the question, a lot of people kind of go down the, oh, here was like you know, some local bands that I got into that I felt like gave me the motivation to, you know, like whatever book my first show or obviously try to put together a band. It's usually that concept where it's like, Oh yes, of course there's like these cool, you know, going to warp tour and seeing these bands, but you're like, it feels so far away from anything that you could like immediately do. Yeah. Uh, so we had this band in Houston called, um, called, um, um, named back to back. They started in 2010, and they were like kind of the the main hardcore band of my like little scene. And they would like do their own shows and tapes and stuff. So that kind of like got me inspired. And and he and I became be- like best friends with all those guys, and 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 and, and we all kind of like have a circle of our own. That it's like we have that same squad that that we had like 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 did like did like did like. I get like it's the same squad that like I've always been with and stuff. And at some points, um, they were inspiring to me. Like I can now we're all just like mutuals and stuff, you know? Yeah. That's, and that is really cool when you are watching a band and you probably feel like they're so much more, you know, advanced or older than you. And then once you get to know them and become friends with them, it's like, they're like three years older than me. It's not yeah, like we're yeah, no, exactly. That's exactly how much older these guys were. Too. <laughs> right. But when you're seeing them, when you're, you know, 13 or whatever, 13 to, you know, 17 years old, you're just like, Oh my gosh, this feels like such a drastic difference. Totally. Yeah. That's cool. And, uh, so would you say that like scores is your first band that, I guess became active outside of your own scene, so to speak. Was that your what you call your first band? No, I mean because because uh, uh, because we actually had it. Um, if my memory is right, I think that 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 Arrowhead started first. Oh, okay, in 2013, but we only just had a couple songs, and like I was always dabbling in hardcore, and Scourge came around a guy after that. Uh, but that was like the first one from Texas where people were like, hey, the Hispanics from Houston, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't it, – it's not my first band, but it was the first hardcore band that people liked, I guess, or cared about. Right, started to pay attention to outside of your own scene. Yeah. And I do think it's also interesting where, like you mentioned, or like we were talking about at the top, where uh, Texas is such an interesting scene. And like you said there, if maybe you don't pay attention to one style of music, you can completely not have any idea what's happening. And it, it seems like there, the cities can also be very compartmentalized as well, where it's like, yeah, man. yeah. I just always became friends with, uh, you know, Daniel from Die Young, and I just always found them to be so interesting because it's like, you know, they did well in Texas and then, you know, some other pockets around the country, but it just seemed like, oh, wow, like if bands do well in their own home scene, that's like what they get fully embraced with. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, I feel like Scourge wouldn't look as good if our videos weren't in Houston, where people where, pe- where people are like going insane and stuff. Like it makes it seem like we have this cool thing go- going on, which we do. But you know, you gotta you always gotta go back to your hometown and look at them because they're the ones that really like that, like really like 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 like, like get your name out there and stuff. Right. Yeah. And then, like you said, start to, especially with the idea that people can access, you know, your music and live shows relatively easily, and then not even understand that you're coming from a particular scene. And then all of a sudden be like, oh, actually that band's from here. Like, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So when you, uh, you know, started to I guess just like, you know, book shows on your own. And like, did you like that aspect of, you know, like, like you mentioned booking your first tour and, um, you know, not, <laughs> I mean, sometimes having a good difficulty yeah. routing and everything like that. Did you like that experience? I liked like meeting, like, like the biggest thing about that is it kind of like 
opened me up socially and like I was able to like to talk to people to people like like I'm kind of shy but like I'm pretty like outgoing if you like like once we like start like like being friends but like it's always hard for me to make the first move and introduce myself and things like that but this kind of like it kind of uh, like it made me do it you know um so yeah I do I don't really like to like like to like to be like in charge of a show but like it's pretty simple to book your own show like if like I have a friend coming through and and my other friends can't do it like I'll step up but right not really my bag to just be a to be a show booker or like a tour thing now sure sure and I'm sure some of that also is tied up in the fact that like did you you know once you started to print merch and understand that there is a business aspect attached to bands was that something that you enjoyed or you just knew that you kind of had to do because that's I, obviously what fans do like, it's like a i just something i knew i had to do type of thing like i guess it is enjoyable but like you know merch is expensive and especially when we were first starting off we were like it costs how much to book to, to the, do 50 shirts things like that so um it is <laughs> helpful not my favorite part about it though Right. <laughs> and I, I think it also is interesting too, because usually a person who is the, um, you know, singer or vocalist or whatever, sometimes a lot of that just falls on them just because they're up front and <laughs> using a microphone. And it's like, that's maybe not sometimes the best decision Trust that you need. Yeah. yeah dude, I'm just like, <laughs> I'm not good at making deals. I'm not very combative. So it's like, it shouldn't be my job, but it is. Just, you know what I mean? Like for now. Sure. It it's is. your, it's your burden to bear. Right? Sure. <laughs> um, when you, uh, when you started to tour and, you know, get outside of, of Houston and start to experience that, did you uh, like it? What's your relationship with touring? Cause I know that there is obviously oh, like two like sides of that coin. Fuck. It's like really fun. It's like cool to okay. be in a band with your best friends and stuff. You know, now that we do it a lot, it is like a job and it is exhausting, but like, I'm still good. I'm still having fun. I'm not like super bummed about going on the road, you know? Right, right. Well, that's cool. And yeah, it's still good to me. I haven't been burnt out completely yet. Right. <laughs> well, and I think sometimes whether a person is a, you know, introvert or extrovert, there's things that people have to do in order to manage you know, staying out the road, whether it's like, oh, maybe I can't talk to everybody after the show because I need to decompress a little bit and that totally sort of like stuff. I, dude, after this last tour we did, um, it was us and Bleed and Temple of Angels. Um, I was kind of tour managing like my own band, like not really tour managing, but I was the one settling out, getting all the guest list stuff and making sure everyone's good. Um, that like helped me out a lot. Like like it taught me some things, taught me that I don't, I don't want to be the one to do that stuff, but it wasn't hard. It was fine. Right. Um, yeah. Did you, um, when you started to, cause I, I know you've, uh, went over to Europe. Was that a culture shock? Was that difficult for you to kind of navigate through that experience? <laughs> a little bit. <clears throat> Like, 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 it's like off top. Like, we we are from America, so we only know fucking English. So it's just like, <laughs> like we're out there. You can't read any signs. And then our our tour manager was British, so he was just as like like shocked as we were. But but you will find that people out there can speak multiple languages. So like, not everyone can. <laughs> Like for the most part, people can understand you. Um, as far as the routing and stuff, it, it was pretty crazy. So we didn't get to like do much. It was just drive hard every day and it was hot. Like I think we went through like a heat wave, uh, but, but it was sick. It wasn't too much of a shock because I've like heard stories and things like that. And like, it's not too different, but you're definitely in like an, in another place, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. 
And I, I know you've uh, spoke about this in your pa- in the past, in regards to interviews and stuff about you know losing your sister, and then the uh, you know idea of coping with substances and kind of you know navigating your way around that. Um, what do you feel? I guess kind of pulled you, you know, from the like the deepest, darkest spots that you could have ended up in. Uh, was it just the connection to, you know, music, or was it friends? Was it a combination of all of those? A combination of all of it, and just like you know, the past, like in 2020, we lost two people. Uh, uh, like guy, like Riley passed away, and so did Wade. So just seeing those people not be here anymore, just kind of like, you know, like it's it just gives you a whole like other outlook on life. And, you know, I'm like, I'm not like super like happy all the time. And like, like I get all that, but like, I feel like the music and then like, I can friends is being there for each other. Like it, it's made me appreciate life like a lot more and like, like here's still a bunch of stuff I haven't done yet. You know what I mean? So like, I just have this outlook now where like, yeah, like it's not always going to be good, but like, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but like, it's fine. Like I'm doing fine, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I think, I mean, I appreciate you tying it back to also seeing, you know, friends that have since passed on because I do think there's that, idea that even though you may be in a bad spot that there's always that compare and contrast of like okay well i am still here and i want to not only make a difference for you know people who i have lost in my family but then my friends and i want to be able to just the simple mentioning of their names is like a really powerful act and i think that that is cool that you're able to have that perspective even going through dark times. Yeah, man. Like it just like showed me like, like our record label, like like is flying us out. Like, so we could make a brand new re like re record. Like that's all I've ever like, that's all I've ever like, like it is like that. That's all I ever like, I wanted from music. So like, it, like it just made me, I'm um, like appreciate all, like all that stuff, you know, like, uh, uh, uh because I was in, 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 influenced by those guys and my friends and stuff. And now like I'm doing this stuff. So I just have a different outlook. And like, I think that reflects on the next record a lot. It's like, it's not really self deprecating and it's not, it's not really happy, but it isn't sad either. You know, it's just like, it's just, it's all like in the, uh, album name like moments of clarity you know like 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 i feel like that that kind of like 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 that kind of says it all you know Mm -hmm. well and i think too as you start to you know just get older gain perspective and have these things you know both positive and negative hit your life that's the only way that you're able to not only experience real life, but then obviously have something that you can uh, jump off of either from a lyrical perspective, yeah. musical perspective, and just offer more than, Hey, here's another record with maybe I can talk about, you know, being in the van, but like, that's pretty limiting. Like yeah, <laughs> not yeah. everybody experiences that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did, yeah. Like, like it's just, yeah, we're getting old. <laughs> it's the fact that we're getting older and like, we just see things differently and we're having way more life experiences. Like, like when we did 12th house rock, I was like, what? I was probably 26, 25. And, and even since then, I like, I feel like I was a stupid, like, like super naive and like immature then. And I'm only 28 now. And (laughs) And I still have way more to figure out, but you know what I mean? Like you just, uh, I'm not in that place it, anymore. And I think that's a, it's a positive thing. Evilgreed.net is an amazing company based out of Berlin, Germany, that offers web store solutions for bands of a certain variety. And when I say that, it is very deliberate because they work with a cool handful of bands. Like they're not open 
their doors wide to be like, all right, every band, every record label, like work with us. No, they are very specific in their point of view. And I'll just name some of the bands to give you an idea. But first, before I do that, use this promo code. 100 words gets you 10% off your order. And I know you may be thinking, Berlin, Germany, I'm here in the States, like that's going to cost a lot of money. No, it doesn't cost a lot of money. And it gets to you lickety quick. Lickety quick, that's not even a word, but you get what I'm saying. Let me just name some of the bands that they work with. They work with Power Trip. They work with Sun. They recently just opened a drain store. They also work with Brutus, Chelsea Wolf, and record labels like Sargent House, Triple B Records. You get it. They have really, really cool stuff. And they have like a massive line of Full of Hell merch. Basically, if they have come on this very podcast, you most likely can buy a piece of merch from them. (laughs) So go to evilgreed.net, use the promo code 100 words, it gets you 10% off your order and have so much fun buying from their really cool web store. I I also think that with the fact that you have different outlets to express yourself, whether it's, you know, playing in Arrowhead or obviously playing in, you know, hardcore bands or just doing, you know, your own uh, individual product projects just for yourself, I'm sure that that is able to bring out more creative things that you can do with all the bands. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, With uh, Narrowhead in particular, uh, you know, I, it it, clearly you are connected with the punk and hardcore scene and, you know, play with bands of all shapes and sizes. Um, But then sonically it's much larger while not like (laughs) there's a, a cliche, I think that happens with a lot of people that, you know, play in punk and hardcore bands. And then they're like, Oh, I, I all of a sudden I found my, my bloody Valentine and I got to be like shoegaze or whatever. Yeah, but like, yeah. you know, and I, to me, narrowhead doesn't fall into that where it's like, it's, it's just a further progression of, you know, what you've guys have been doing musically for a long time. Is that something that either you notice kind of existing and you're trying to make sure you don't fall into that cliche, or is that just like, you know, a, a symptom of you guys growing older as musicians? No, I think like like we've come from the hardcore scene, so 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 we like we've always wanted to bring that that aggro like sound and stuff. But we also like we like I said before, like we grew up on Sunny Day, Yale Estate, and stuff like that. So um, as far as the shoegaze thing goes, like yeah, like My Bloody Valentine, but that was never like our goal. But I think people these days don't know like how to talk about music and they just kind of just drop names and things like that. Um, But, but yeah, it's not like anything we, it's nothing we've done on purpose and it's nothing we've like tried to stay like away from. We just kind of want to embrace every angle and element of our band, you know? Right. Yeah. We can play a hardcore show. Cool. And we can play like with a rock band. And things like that. And like, and we could play, we, like we get the shoegaze band, you know, uh, because like there's all of those things that are in Arrowhead. Uh, uh, I think like uh, I wouldn't call ourselves a shoegaze band, but I could hear some elements to it, but it's not enough to call it that, you know? Right. Like you can exist on the, the fringes of it. And like you said, play with bands of that nature, but not, you know, that's the only influence you're pulling from. Do Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Did you um kind of, kind of looking at the fact that you did have this musical background with you know your your dad and uncle playing in bands and stuff like that and showing you a wide variety of bands um did you I- I'm guessing that that uh, you know opened up your eyes to you know not just being like a punk or a hardcore kid because you know when you're young you really just like stick yeah, to that yeah. lane um do you think that was really what opened up your eyes to all these different styles of music so early. No, honestly, I think hardcore is what made me appreciate all different types of music because, you know, when you listen to a hardcore band and they drop their first like demo or something, it usually sounds like shit, but in a good way, you know? So like it helped me, like it helped me see through rough quality in recordings and just appreciate the audio for what it is. And I think that opened me up to all types of music, you know, like if it's not something that I, uh, uh, I immediately agree, like agree with, like I'm still, I'm still open to it, you know? 
Right. Yeah. I, I like that idea that especially too with, you know, I think the whatever Spotify many years ago did a study where it's like people I think that are, you know, 32 or 33 years old, that's when they stop seeking out new music. And I, I think that that idea that your music taste calcifies and you don't, you know, it's like listening to anything different is like, oh, that's what the kids listen to. I can't listen to that. And yeah. <laughs> it just no. shuts you off. You got to keep your ears open to what the little kids are saying because because they're up next, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> totally. Within reason. I mean, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, yeah they're but no. Mom is fuck too, but you know. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> well, of course, yeah. Well, the last thing you want to do is be like, all right, let's follow where the kids are going. And then all of a sudden, you know, Narrowhead is – uh, Off a cliff and then we're on like fucking TikTok <laughs> or something. You know? but that's cool <laughs> too. If you want to throw us on TikTok, throw us on there. Totally, yeah. You're like, I'm not going to say no to that, but I, <laughs> we're not playing music that's intended for that platform. Exactly. We're not making a TikTok dance or anything, you know. <laughs> but, but but when the kids are talking, you should listen sometimes. Yeah. And, and I, I'm sure it's uh, been interesting for you to navigate these decisions of, you know, hey, like we have a booking agent and here's these tours that we get an opportunity to take a part of, whether it's, you know, touring with white reaper or whether it's you know playing a outbreak fest over in the uk um do you still just kind of look at these opportunities as like okay like this is a good tour because we're hanging out with friends or we'll maybe play in front of a new audience do you really take them kind of as they come um yeah like yeah yeah i'd say so like it like it it is it, it's hard to say that that we have a real like strategy or game plan because yeah because it's it, like it's at it, it's like we take it as it comes you know and uh that that does influence our uh, our decision to do it like because like, if we're gonna see friends or like if like if we think it's a good idea to uh, uh, open up like I did do it like for a band that um so we can get like um some new fans and things like that yeah uh, but there's no real game plan or strategy it's kind of like we just take it as it comes yeah right like you don't have this uh here's this five to you know seven year plan about what the band is going to yeah. do it's just it's instinctual more or less totally yeah and uh, two last things I want to hit you before I, I let you go. The, um, you know, the idea of, since a lot of people are, you know, especially within the past year, year and a half, discovering Narrowhead, even though you guys have obviously put out, you know, a decent amount of music and toured and played a lot of shows before then. Um, is it interesting to kind of watch the ebb and flow of how people are introduced to you, whether it is like, because you played a festival or whether it's like simply being delivered via a Spotify algorithm. Yeah, it is interesting because you know, like it's like, we, uh, I feel we aren't the type of band that when we first came out that we were just going to blow up and be like a hype thing. Uh, I feel like we needed to have a catalog of music before pe people really, uh, uh, understood our sound and stuff because like when you put out like an ep when we first started it was like five songs and people were into it but it wasn't enough to tell to like tell our story yet you know so like it's hard to get someone e e interested when you don't have the full context yet and and some bands are able to just blow up like that uh because they like delivered it really well but but I think it took us some time to figure our shit out too. So like, I feel like we're growing and the people are finding out about us now it, it is because we went through that stuff. You know, I, that's honestly, that's such a, uh, I, I really like the way that you describe that because I do think that especially with the quickness that people consume and make judgments on music or bands, whether it's like, you know, I, I can imagine people being like, oh yeah, I listened to, you know, Narrowhead's first EP or first LP. And it was like, eh, they're all right. And then like yeah. never dip back into you, but yeah, you're exactly. like, so like, right. 
I think because we've been a band for so long and people are just starting to figure it out, I think that means that we're on a fad. Like in my opinion, I guess. I, like I don't really know what's going on out there, but but I feel like we would have faded out like, like if people didn't care. Right. Or or alternatively, to your point, you're glad people are, are dipping in now yeah. and listening to <laughs> rather than be like, oh, I'm glad you didn't listen to our earlier stuff. Like not like it's bad, but just like no, yeah, I, I feel yeah. much more confident now. I've noticed after coming back from a tour that our back catalog is played a lot more too, because people like didn't know about it or something. And that's cool. Like when you can find about, it's cool when you find a band that you're really into, and then you find out that, 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 that they actually have like a bunch of songs or that you can go back and check out. Right. Right. Yeah. That's it. it, It's true to feel like you all of a sudden have this, you know, wealth of music to go through. It's not just like, oh, it's a five song demo and that's all I can listen to. It's like, oh damn, yeah. they got records out before this? Sick. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe at the time when those came out, I didn't have that same men- mentality, but now I'm older and now I've seen shit and like, huh? I, 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 I'm seeing people f- like find out about us. Like it definitely ha- has made me see things that way. Sure. Absolutely. And uh, the last thing I wanted to, uh, and this may be a difficult question for you to ask because, uh, you know, Texas clearly represents within the, uh, the context of, of punk and hardcore. Um, would you, uh, you know, I mean, between power trip and iron age, uh, there, there is, I mean, they both obviously traveled within the hardcore scene, but you know, one like power trip clearly went along the more metal route, whereas iron age was just always this kind of weirdo band. Um, do you think that, you know, I guess either could have existed without the other or they were, I mean, I know that they were obviously at different time periods, but like, you know, how do you reflect on the legacy of both of those bands as far as getting Texas's name out there? I mean, as far as I've known and everyone else would like, we agree is I don't think there'd be a power trip without Iron Age, you know, cause it's just, I don't think there'd be a lot of things without Iron Age to be honest, but yep. I, like definitely when power trip first came, came out like i like i remember like a bunch of people being like oh it's like an it, it's like the it's like the iron age like baby brother or something but but then power trip just came out and just like fucking did their own thing and like and surpassed like a bunch of i and surpassed like so many expectations and stuff like i'm not saying that like, like i've always i've always known that they were going to be like huge but but it surpassed a lot of like expectations and stuff. But yeah, like I'd say uh, Iron Age is really going to get responsible and Power Trip just carried that torch like, 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 like way further than we could have imagined. Right, right. And I, I think to your point too, it's just one of those things it takes, you know, this, this <laughs> legacy of bands, to, like you said, passing the torch between one another and hopefully the momentum can keep going to where all of a sudden people realize that like, Oh yes, I need to pay attention to this scene. Even though now yeah. in the digital age, people don't even really identify that bands are from certain areas. Dude. Yeah. What a great chat with Mr. Jacob. And uh, like I said, please listen to Narrowhead. If you, for whatever reason, like myself, were just kind of lukewarm on them initially, this new LP will really, I think, flip your wig and you will, uh, even if you're not wearing a wig, it will literally put it on your, I'm sorry, bad joke. But anyways, thank you to Jacob. Thank you to Bailey, his publicist, for hooking this up. Really enjoy the conversation. Next week, I have an old friend on the show, and that's not because he's old as a human, even though technically he is, but that's okay. His name is Tucker Rule. He is the drummer for awesome, legendary post-hardcore band Thursday. He also plays in a band called LS Dunes with uh, Frank from My Chemical Romance, Anthony from Seosin, Cirque Survive, Sound of Animals Fighting, five other million projects, but you get it. Tucker is a real one, and we had a fun conversation while he was out on the road, and he actually, you know, we missed each other a few times, but we're able to nail it home. So that's what we got next week, and as I always say, until next week, please be safe, everybody.